Speaker Pelosi has landed in Singapore to start her visit to Asia. Uh, is there any mention of Taiwan on her official itinerary? No. Uh. The official itinerary mentions four countries, Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, and Japan. However, she could make a surprise trip to Taiwan. And there's a report that says Taiwan and a U.S. official say she's expected to go there. Um, they say she's going to stay overnight. They don't say when she will land and do so. But look, China has increased its provocations toward the U.S. if Speaker does, in fact, visit. State media went as far as saying they'll shoot down her plane. Mm. What does that say about our standing in the world where China or anybody thinks that they can say something like that? It was surprisingly harsh, that statement. It was a direct threat yeah. against the person who was third in line to uh, take over the Oval Office. Let's bring in a former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, who joins us this morning. Mr. Secretary, do you think that Speaker Pelosi should go to Taiwan? Well, Stuart, good morning. Great to be with you. Um, she should absolutely go. Uh, I suppose six months ago it, it wouldn't have mattered as much, but once it was pretty clear she wanted to go there and intended to go there, uh, you can't pull that trip down because the Chinese Communist Party sends out some third-rate propagandist to threaten her or to threaten the United States of America. Uh, President Biden said, well, the military doesn't want her to go. That was an enormous tactical mistake, especially against the backdrop of a broader relationship between the United States and China, one where China has now said that they provide limitless support to Russia. For them now to threaten the Speaker of the House and tell her where she can and can't go makes absolutely no sense. Stuart, you and I have talked about uh, Hollywood backing down from putting things in particular movies. We've talked about Wall Street uh, kowtowing to the Chinese Communist Party, still operating where there's a million people in internment camps. For the Speaker of the House to kowtow in that same way, too, Fold to Chinese propaganda is a sign of weakness and one that the Chinese Communist Party will drive a truck through. What should our response be to this? Well, I would, I, I would first of all make sure we weren't on defense. One of the things that this administration has failed to understand is that if you're always defending, if they threaten and you're just, just deciding whether to accede to the threat or not without responding in a material way, so you could imagine... You can imagine lots of options. You could say, well, we're going we're gonna to reduce Chinese student visas by 50,000 next year if you fly an airplane up and threaten the Speaker of the House. You could say we're going to impose some economic pain on the Chinese. Right? There are so many tools. We have so much power. This, we're still the greatest nation in the history of civilization, Stuart. To think that, boy, some propagandist from the Global Times inside of China can issue this kind of threat, and the United States will just... Uh, you know, uh, be, become bedwetters, worried about whether or not our speaker can actually travel to an independent sovereign nation freely is a real sign of weakness. And the whole world's watching, especially, Stuart, especially our friends, mm -hmm. the Japanese, the Australians, the South Koreans, all the countries in Southeast Asia. If President Biden pulls this trip down and then we turn around and ask them someday, they said, hey, China's threatening you. We want you to respond to them. They're going to say, when you had your moment, you folded. We're going to fold, too. China's counting on that. Let's transfer to another front. Vladimir Putin is warning that Russia's naval forces will soon get hypersonic missiles and they've got a new naval doctrine that labels America as the country's top global adversary. What should our response to that be? Stuart, those were statements. And in one case, he signed a document talking about a, Ch a Russian naval. We should study that. We should understand what they're doing. We, we know a lot about the Russian Navy. Uh, you, should, uh, you should not underestimate them, although we've seen what the Russian army failed to be able to do in Ukraine. Uh, but these tools, these hypersonic tools that you described, Stuart, these are, these are serious weapon systems. Uh, I can't say too much other than uh, we need to make sure that we are doing all the work that's needed to do. We can't underfund our military the way President Biden has done. We need to prepare not only defensively to prevent them from using them and deter them from using those weapons, but we need to make sure we are capable of responding in a way that Vladimir Putin will understand and deter him from ever even thinking about deploying one of those weapon systems against the United States of America. Do you think we would be facing this kind of threat from China and Russia had we not had this debacle in Afghanistan almost exactly one year ago? Uh, I think what happened in Afghanistan was... Uh, a, a benchmark for all of our adversaries. They saw an America that did things it's never done before. Uh, it left Americans behind. It withdrew uh, from a fight in a way that didn't support our friends and allies after 20 years of commitment, right? The way in which we departed was something the whole world watched. Uh, whether, whether some of this would have happened or not, Stuart, it's, it's always difficult to know. But I don't think for a moment our adversaries didn't see that, 
see a president that was unwilling to show the resolve to protect America and defend our interests in the world. And I think they are now pressing us, chasing us, testing us to see if this president will actually stand up for the American people in the way that we did for four years. Mr. Secretary, thanks as always for coming on the show today. Stuart, we do appreciate thank it. you very much. Have a great morning, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you.